Well, good morning, everybody. Really glad to have you. I I made up a bunch of outlines for our time together. If you don't have an outline, there's some extras here. If somebody would help, just pass those around. I love coming back to Talbot Seminary School of Theology, and I have thoroughly enjoyed our continuing relationship with Talbot and good people that are involved. I, I love being in the ministry. I've loved being a pastor now for 33 years, and I've had the great privilege of being a pastor at the same church for all 33 years. That says a lot about uh, our assembly. Uh, As I was uh, beginning my ministry, uh, I learned a lot about what God wanted me to do and a lot about what God doesn't want me to do. And I'd like to share just a couple of thoughts with you, seven as a matter of fact, of things that I've discovered in my own life about leaks that drain your soul in ministry. Uh, I I love the fact that God's calling to us is good, his calling to us is gracious, his calling to us is is beautiful in every way, but in the ministry there's some costs. Costs that we have to be willing to pay and that we have to be aware of. If we're going to stay in ministry for long term, here are seven things that I think you've got to, got to come to grips with. I saw these seven siphons written in an article by Dr. Gordon MacDonald, and I took and adapted them into this message, this time together, because they resonated so profoundly with me. So what will drain your soul in ministry? First, the key things that we will see are words without practice. Uh, People in the ministry live in the world of words. We teach, we preach, we counsel, we exhort. All ministry that use words, it's at the very core of what I do, what we do in ministry. But it is precisely here that we experience a very, very subtle drain of our souls The principle that you have to be aware of is this. Saying something does not actualize it. Uh, We can be notorious in the ministry about preaching on prayer. And there's something about teaching about prayer that makes us think we're good prayers. Uh, It happens a lot. We, We speak oftentimes about relationships, especially marriage relationships. And we expound the passages of scriptures in Colossians and Ephesians about what it takes to have a good marriage. But it doesn't always mean we do. Just because we say something does not actualize it. We can talk a lot about evangelism. We can talk a lot about missions, about serving the least of these. But unless we go next door and interact with the pagan that lives there, We're falling far short, far short of what God would have for us. And we'll begin to discover that our souls begin to leak because words seem like they actualize realities in their lives when they really don't. The blessing to our souls comes from the doing, beloved. James said it clearly, one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man, this woman, will be blessed in what he, what's it say? He does. The blessing comes in the doing. So here's a decision that I had to make early on, and I would encourage you to do the same. Think this through. You have to decide to be a tree and not a pipe. Both trees and pipes are conduits of water. Water will go through a pipe, pass clearly through it, but have very little impact on that pipe. A tree takes water through its roots, and the roots go up and nourish that tree, producing limbs and branches, producing leaves and then fruits, and then the water evaporates through the leaves out into the sky, and the process continues over and over and over again. One has no impact on the delivery system, and the other brings life itself. 
Listen to me, if you're gonna go in the ministry, you're gonna be involved in helping other people understand God's perfect word, this law of liberty that sets them free. You gotta be a tree, not a pipe. You have to let the word of God go into you and minister to you that you live it out in practice to the best of your ability. Then you will have some fruit to share with other people. If you don't, all it will be is words without practice. A second drain. Anybody relate to what I'm talking about? What will drain your soul in ministry? Busyness without purpose. Busyness without purpose. When I was a college student at San Diego State, that bastion of orthodoxy, (laughs) I sensed God's calling in my heart and I went to visit a pastor and being from a Roman church background, I'd never talked to a pastor before. And I went to him and I asked him about what it meant to be in the ministry. And he told me about a very, very busy life, an exceptionally busy life. Now, 33 years later, I had no idea how busy a life it demands of you. I relate to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, when he talks about such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. In our assembly, we've had the privilege of planting other churches, and there is pressure, continual pressure, to watch over and to guide and to lead and to shepherd, to instruct, to oversee. And the demands of people and programs and conversations and activities can be overwhelming. And sometimes it gets to be a bit much, quite frankly. Here's what I've learned that just because the ministry calls doesn't mean that God is calling. Do you understand that? The ministry will always have constant demands on your time and your energy, but if those time commitments aren't disciplined by the values of calling and purpose, energy is quickly depleted. And therefore, every single one of us, and many of you as you're anticipating ministry or actively involved in ministry, you have to stop long enough to say, why in the world am I doing what I'm doing? What have I been called to do? What gifting has he blessed? What gifting has he used? What has he made me good at? And once you know what that calling is, it's critically important that you make some time to do that in your ministry. Otherwise, people begin to set the agenda for your life and your ministry rather than God setting the agenda. And when when people set the agenda in the long run, what you end up doing is resenting the ministry because it drains you rather than replenish you. Thus, I had to make a decision early on in my ministry I had to throw my 95 mile an hour fastball. Do you understand the baseball analogy? When you have a 95 mile an hour fastball, throw it. It's good to develop a curveball. It's good to develop a, a change up or a slider. But when you've got an out pitch, use it. Use it as often as you can. And in the preaching ministry, it means preaching and spending the time that you need to do to preach well, to study well, to use the gifting that God has given you to use. There's an old joke among preachers that if you preach well, people will forgive half your mistakes. If you keep the baptismal waters hot, they'll forgive your other half. (laughs) Do what you do best. And that doesn't mean that that's all you get to do. The ministry obviously requires all kinds of responsibilities. All kinds of different things. I preach for free at our church. They pay me to do everything else. 
And if I don't set the agenda and listen carefully to God's agenda, my study time goes right out the window because of the other demands of ministry. And if I don't throw my 95 miles, if I don't do what I'm best at, at some point in time, the ministry will become the enemy rather than the privilege. Anybody here relate to what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? What will drain your soul? Thirdly, calendars without a Sabbath. Calendars without a Sabbath. Luke chapter 10 records the familiar story of Jesus dining in the home of Lazarus with Mary and Martha, familiar to all of us. We know that Martha became distracted with all of her preparations, Mary sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus. In her harried state, Martha actually got to the point where she rebuked the Lord. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? then tell her to help me. Come on, Jesus, can't you see all that I'm doing? Remember the Lord's comments to her? Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about how many things? So many things. Only one thing is necessary, just one. Mary's chosen the good part, and I'm not taking that away from her. Sitting at the feet growing in our love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, learning from him, enjoying him, worship and adoring him. This is the good part. The principle I discovered, it's not the things that you do in ministry that kill you, it's the things that you don't get done. Every day when I leave our campus, there's always more to do, always. There's always five Marios to call or five Esperanzas to call. There's always people to visit in the hospital. There's always more sermons to prepare. Who doesn't have the need to pray more? Letters to write, budgets to oversee people to interact with, neighbors, the unsaved. And I've discovered that I can become worried and bothered about a lot of things in my life. An outlook calendar that's filled with appointments with everyone other than God violates the commandments and sees the ministry only from a short-term perspective. If you're going to stay it in long in, in long term in ministry, you're going to have to set aside some time. And anybody who thinks that they have to work because the devil works, you know, the devil never takes a vacation, so why should I ever take a break? Well, since when has the devil been our role model? <laughs> I mean, you know the text in Genesis, God himself rested. Not because he was tired but to give us an example. And he commanded us, you need a break. Thus I had to make a decision. Rest, reflection, and exercise are not optional for me. They get on my calendar just like every other appointment does. I have dates with my wife on my calendar. And if somebody calls and says, hey, can I see you tonight? The answer is, no, I got another appointment. And it happens to all of us in ministry. You have your one day off after two weeks of work and somebody calls and says, oh, pastor, I got to see you right away. Nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, if you simply just delve a little deeper into the issues, well, what's the problem? Well, my wife and I, we're really having troubles. How long have the troubles been going on? Oh, 43 years? Well, okay, well then I'll see you tomorrow morning then. (laughs) Do you know what I'm talking about here? This is what it is. 
A calendar that doesn't include time to fill you up will soon suck you dry. And that's why the Lord told his disciples, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. You see why? You see the explanation? Many people coming and going and they didn't even have time to eat. There's sometimes in life, especially in ministry life, where it's just busy and the demands are everywhere. And we all know what it's like to work 13, 14, 15 hours a day. And we do it gladly. But you cannot keep doing that over the long haul without running your soul dry. So watch out. Does this resonate with anybody? You getting this? What will drain your soul forth? Relationships without mutual nourishment. Uh, We pastors, and especially our wives, notorious for being surrounded by people, crowds of people. It's what we do. If you're in the ministry, you're in the people business. That's why we have the little thing on my on front of my desk. It's the people, stupid. It just reminds me. Because sometimes I'm tempted to think it's the stupid people. And I just have to, <laughs> I have to keep reminding them. I'm in the people business. And here's what I learned. It's easy in ministry to be acquainted with too many people, but to be known by too few. I've always been impressed with Paul's writings in 2 Corinthians chapter seven. I love 2 Corinthians, Paul's most transparent book. He reveals his deepest struggles in life. 2 Corinthians chapter seven, verse five. All right, for even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side. He's getting battles every place he was going, this area of Macedonia. But it hit him inside, conflicts without. What did he have within? Fears within. And this is the apostle, very honest, very truthful. But notice what God did for him. But God, who comforts the, what's the word? The depressed. I don't know if you ever knew that Paul battled it. To be pressed down. Uh, The NIV translates the word as discouraged, the downtrodden. He comforted us by the coming of Titus. With all the fears within, with all the conflicts without, you're looking at an apostle who was pretty beat up at this time. And the pressures made him downcast. It cast him down. And the pressure and the pressure and the pressure to perform, and the pressure and the pressure and pressure of enemies and persecution, the care and concern for all the churches overwhelmed him. But then Titus showed up. And with Titus came help, a friend, a friend that he could be honest with, a friend that could be, he could be truthful with, a friend who could comfort him. So the question is, do you have a Titus? In ministry, you're gonna need one, either within the church or outside the church. But you're gonna need somebody that in all honesty and all truthfulness you can do life with. Thus, the decision. You gotta take the risk of honestly sharing in some kind of a reciprocal relationship. We're talking about a soul friend here. It's a loving husband who'll listen to you, who'll take you when you're up and when you're down. It's a loving wife who nourishes, cares, helps, encourages. And if you don't have that soul friend somewhere that you can download with, you won't gain any significant personal spiritual momentum because most of your energy will be consumed with dealing with your own pain. In ministry then, 
takes on the form of that which destroys you rather than that which replenishes you. I love being a pastor. I love being in the ministry. I thank the Lord for the calling that he's given to me. And there's a price to pay, willingly, gladly, gonna pay it. If anybody wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. There's a price to it. I just wanna do it with a full soul. And therefore you have to watch these leaks that are gonna come because they happen to all of us. A fifth leak, what'll drain your soul? Personality without healthy self-examination. This has been my own personal journey with this. Ministry is easily built on very unhealthy needs. All of us went into the ministry because of God's calling in our lives, and there's a mandate that we all get, both subjectively and objectively, this calling, a burning bush experience of some kind. All you preachers know, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. But that calling is mixed with a healthy desire to genuinely help people, but it's also shaped and influenced by who we are the experiences that we go through, and that at times can be prompted by an unhealthy anger, a need to control, a power and a prestige that comes from what we do. Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 23, of the hypocritical Pharisees. They loved the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. Who doesn't like being called rabbi? Teacher, professor, pastor, shepherd, missionary, youth leader, counselor. Well, like it, not wrong. But oftentimes ministry is tainted by the need to have people say, that was the greatest message I ever heard in my life. And something inside of my head says, oh man, isn't God lucky to have me? And I think that's part of the reason why pornography and adultery are such common problems among pastors. There's this uh, unhealthy need for approval. And I call it easy intimacy. That's, what, that's all pornography is, it's easy intimacy. It's a fantasy. Intimacy is hard work. But what happens is we develop this fantasy in our minds that you don't have to go through the work and that relationships can be plastic. And that's what gets fed on the external. Oh, you're the greatest from people who don't even know you. And so in my own journey of thinking through, why am I doing this? And Lord, keep working in me. Keep transforming me into the man that you want to be, want me to be. I discovered early on in the ministry that I couldn't play father to the world. It felt good trying. But I needed the body of Christ to be the body of Christ. I needed people around me with different gifts, different abilities, better abilities to do the things that I felt at times I had to do and I was doing at times more for my own sake than for other people's sake. When I tried to do it myself, I learned at some point in time I had to stop and maybe that's the same for you. What'll drain your soul? Let me wrap this up. A discipline without variety. 
principle, a checkoff mentality and devotion leads to a shallow, predictable experience with God. I'm turning 60 here in uh, March of next year, and my wife um, read something about how a man loses 1% of his muscle mass every year after the age of 50. And so she got the bright idea that I ought to start working out. <laughs> and, so, and so I went with her to the gym a few times and um, there was a person there that, uh, one of the instructors, the trainers, who talked about the shock and awe principle. Are you familiar with shock and awe? Uh, in terms of exercise, if you do the same exercise over and over and over and over again, your muscles develop muscle memory until you change the things up and you realize how weak you really are. And you have to do shock and awe every once in a while in your exercise regimen if you're going to develop a whole health regimen. Well, the same is true in the spiritual dimension. There are times to walk and pray, sit and pray, write your prayers. Time to pray alone, pray with others, pray in a large group. There's time to read the word, memorize the word, meditate on the word. There's lots of variety. My decision, I'm not gonna fall into a rut. Any of you in a rut right now? You know who you are, if you are, you just get shock and awe. What'll drain your soul? Natural giftedness without spiritual character. Many of us in San Diego, we are keenly aware of our football team and how bad we are um, this year. But there was uh, a quarterback for the San Diego Chargers by the name of Ryan Leaf. Came out of the University of Washington. I think it was 6'5", 6'6", 250, 260 pounds, could throw the ball 100 miles. And they paid him, at that time, exorbitant amount of money, $13 million signing bonus. They just gave him a check for $13 million and then gave him a contract. And he played for a few years, but the thing about Ryan Leaf is his character didn't match up to his abilities had all the abilities in the world, but no character whatsoever. And as a result, he didn't last. Because abilities can carry you a certain way for a certain period of time. But it's your character that will come through. What I discovered, pastors can go a long way on chutzpah. I mean, you can go on the web and you can uh, download sermons, and you can develop catchy phrases, and uh, you add to it a certain amount of political savvy of dealing with people. A decent sense of humor. Some organizational abilities. And you mix it all together, and presto, out comes a megachurch pastor, right? Long-term kingdom advancement demands much, much more than chutzpah. And Paul told the Corinthians, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of a man, a woman, but instead rest on the power of God. Leaks that'll drain your soul. As Mick mentioned, I've had the privilege of serving in a number of capacities in our assembly. 
when I moved into adult ministries, the reason I did is our, my predecessor was diagnosed with bone cancer. And uh, he and I ham and egged the pulpit for four years while he went through his treatments. And uh, as he got um, sicker, uh, the thoughts of what we were gonna do in terms of transition uh, began to, uh, the conversation started to accelerate. And so I went to him and I asked him, because I'd never been a senior pastor before, I said, uh, what's the key? Just tell me, what's the key? I've not done this before. He said, there's only one key, really in all ministry. You're gonna stay in it for the long term. You gotta stay low before the Lord. You'll learn how to do all the other things. Be involved here at Biola University or, or, or Talbot here. And I'll be eternally grateful for my education at Talbot. And the privilege that I had to go here. We've been charged with an enormous responsibility in the pastoral ministry. We deal with people in the loftiest of subjects from creation to evil, heaven and hell, reconciliation, the Godhead. A great calling demands a great spirituality. But it is precisely here that I oftentimes feel so weak and ill-equipped to fulfill it. And thus my heart resonates with Paul. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful. Not that I was, but he considered me faithful, putting me into service. He had a vision, a plan and a process for me. With strong assurance, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, that faithful is he who calls you and he also will bring it to pass. Most everyone in ministry has a story of a leaky soul. Mine hit me most profoundly uh, two years after I took on the additional responsibility as a senior pastor in our assembly. And I developed chest pains. I remember laying on my couch thinking, oh no. And what I had done is, uh, over, the last, over the, those first two years as I ran my soul dry. And uh, if you give me, forgive me just for being just a little transparent here in my own journey, and I'll wrap this up here. Um, I took on too many things thinking that too much of ministry was revolving around me. And there were some external things that contributed to that after Richard died our uh, counseling pastor of 23 years had a cerebral hemorrhage, he retired. Our assistant pastor of 40 years had a heart attack, he retired. And so everything was just kind of focused at this point in time in terms of senior leadership on me. And, uh, and just because I didn't handle the pressure properly, I, I stopped sleeping. And I was sleeping maybe three or four hours a night. And things got so bad that I stopped eating. And you don't sleep and you don't eat and things get pretty bad in a hurry. And so I went away to speak at a conference. Here I am a spiritual life speaker and I have my first panic attack while I'm up at the conference. And I'm sitting up there in the cabin and all my dear wife can do is hold me. And I'm just crying, I'm just crying, crying, crying. And uh, so we call a, a counselor, a friend of ours in our assembly and uh, I go down and sit for the first time in a psychiatrist's office and try to get some things figured out. And a delightful Christian man, loves the Lord, knows the word. He met with me once, just once. And I shared with him what was going on and he gave me some insights as to what I needed to do. And some of this is involved in this. But he looked at me and he said, Dennis, now you know how everybody in your church feels. You're dented. You understand that? You're dented. And God calls dented 
people into the ministry. And what I've discovered in my own life is God's power shows up best in dented people. But it's in my own denting that I realize that I have to stay close to the Lord. And I'm grateful. Oh, I'm so very, very grateful that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, and God has promised that his grace will indeed be sufficient. If you believe it, say amen. 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 The Lord's grace is sufficient. All right, let's pray and let you all go. All right, before everybody goes racing out of here, everybody just take a deep breath together, will you? All right. The God of the universe is here with us. You know that? He's got you. And not going to let you go. And if you can take just a minute now, ask for the Lord's help. Before you go running on to your next responsibility. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right arm. Oh, our Father in heaven, you're so good. It's just so good to talk to you, Father to know of your love, to know of your acceptance, to know of your holiness, to know of your mercy, to know of your grace. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the redemption that you earned on our behalf. And we want, Lord, our our souls full as you use us and minister through us as you help as we give and in the sacrifices and the giving of ourselves away to others in need. That for my sisters and brothers that you would buoy us up by the power of your spirit, enable us and work in us, through us, even in the dense, Lord. Use those for your honor and for your glory. And even this day, Father, even this day, with all the studies, would you give to my sisters and brothers, would you give to these dear co-workers a special sense of your presence this day? That as we draw close, that we would receive grace, find plenty of help in time of need. So we'll commit this to you. Pray that you give us good dialogue as we interact. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.